Well, Chinese stocks listed on American exchanges continue to feel the heat from a crackdown out of Beijing. Uh, officials there say they're concerned about uh, business and industry industry secrets and privacy. I think it's sort of ironic, uh, almost funny, except that American investors are getting slammed on this news. Uh, by the way, Chinese companies, they raised $75 billion in U.S. listings since 2010, $12.5 billion in 14 offerings this year alone. So what's the message here? What should be done to make sure that American investors are better protected? Joining me now, the Bonson Group Managing Partner, David Bonson. David, of course, you're a pure capitalist, but how worried are you uh, about sort of the weaker due diligence that, that it takes for a Chinese company to list versus an American company? And does the mercurial actions of the communist government pose a, a sort of a constant threat? You know, one day they're OK, the next day they're not. Yeah, I'm such a capitalist that I fully support people making the decision not to invest in such insanity. I'm for people uh, being exercising the responsible decision to know what they own and what the risks are and to avoid these things that ought to be avoided. In this case, uh, Didi clearly did not have the affectionate relationship with the Communist Chinese Party that was necessary to avoid this. But American investors know that or certainly can know that if they're doing due diligence. Most people own international stocks through an intermediary. Most people are using a fund or a money manager or whatnot. I think it's incumbent upon the fund manager to know what they're buying and why they're buying it. And those risks that you refer to, people can make the decision to proceed if they want. People have made a lot of money off of Alibaba as an example. But in this case, it was not something that people could not have known if they did some homework. Right. Great point. Hey, the IPO market itself has been on fire. I mean, in terms of a whole lot of deals, uh, but it's already past the old go-go tech bubble days I mean, and a stream of unprofitable companies for some raising a yellow flag, even a red flag. How worried are you? Uh, is there a darker color than red we could use on this one? <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I, look, I, I think that bubbles go until bubbles burst. And and from Japan in the late 80s to dot com that you refer to, to that housing bubble in 08, uh, those bubbles had been going for a couple of years before they ended up bursting. And so I don't know when this ends, but I am a fundamentalist. And what I mean by that is ultimately all prices revert to the mean. They all come back to what is a reasonable valuation and where people are buying things on froth and excess and euphoria, they are taking a, a significant amount of risk right now. Well, Nancy Pelosi, uh, she has a different technique. I'm not 100% sure what it is, uh, but she's got one hell of a track record. More recently, she bought some Amazon, Apple, and some others. Now, th the reason I bring this up is obviously lawmakers have an inside track on things like legislation. There's supposed to be rules that we know are mostly overshadowed. And this, a lot of these newer investors are feeling like, hey, this is unfair. Should lawmakers be allowed to buy individual stocks? No, it's, it, it, this isn't even controversial. Even if someone did nothing wrong, even if it was just simply very prudent and appropriate portfolio management, the appearance of impropriety, the potential for casting this kind of doubt, adding to cynicism. Do, does our society need more cynicism, more tribalism? It is easily solvable by allowing legislators to put their money into either a blind trust or using ETF and indexed vehicles. But the idea of having individual securities can't possibly end well. This is so easy to solve. It's ridiculous. David, always, always appreciate our conversations. Thank you so much, my friend. Appreciate it. Thanks, Charles.